of dark matter, dark energy, the inhomogeneous to fleeting gas. Uh, a lot of young people in the audience uh, might have been in primary school at the time, so they wouldn't have remembered what it was like back then. The only thing I compare it to in terms of the upset, that the discovery that we only understood about 5% of the universe, that most of the universe was dark matter and dark energy, and we knew nothing about it. The only thing I compare it to is the election of Donald Trump. <laughs> it's that sort of upset. And it was in that environment um, that we put up this paper, and this paper generated a lot of interest. Why? Well, because it offered a sort of paradigm, an interesting paradigm for organizing things. It sort of makes sense of the universe. Um, it came about, I must say, by accident. I had been working on some quite different stuff, trying to look at the collapse of neutrinos, sterile neutrinos, to form compact objects that would be a replacement for black holes, when some people, commensurate with Tillum Square, came out with a paper in which they said, there's this interesting thing, what do you think called it? It's fleeting gas, and it evolves. It evolves in time from matter-like behavior in the early universe to dark energy-like behavior in the late universe, and therefore could be a replacement for quintessence which was the leading alternative for a uh, cosmological constant. And so I looked at this and I thought to myself, well, okay, there's a density that's involved here too, and if I have a high enough density because of the equation of state, then I can have regions, local regions, in which there is matter-like behavior, and that could be the galaxies. So actually, if you do, do it in an inhomogeneous model, then you could have dark matter and dark energy arising out of the same thing. And then you put it in the context of string theory, it actually looks quite pretty. Right? And so through the years, I mean, it's continued to excite people, the general philosophy of this thing. Um, in fact, just earlier this year, I got an email from a student doing honors in astronomy here, who was doing a project about this. And he, of course, asked some awkward questions. All right. Uh, some questions that in those 500 plus citations, and I should mention that it's now, I, do, I just looked today, it's 650, 653 plus another 50 plus another 50 in associated papers. Um, it has a lot of interesting stuff in it philosophically, but he asked the following questions. Uh, does it solve, for example, the, um, does it solve the problem that lambda, there's a lambda-like term, which is this constant of fleeting gas. Does it solve the hierarchy problem? No, it does not. Okay? Does it explain really why, in some fundamental way, that it has to be that the um, structure formation in the model uh, is associated with the acceleration today? No, I had to say to him, it does not. And of course, he didn't ask the most awkward question of all, does it work, was ever to reply. No, it does not. Uh, so very soon, within a year, basically this model, as it was, was dead and buried. Okay. And the first night in that process was some people who published papers trying to do the following. Um, look at this thing in the context of ordinary friedman robertson walker perturbation theory. Okay. And they said, well, it doesn't work. It does not give you the matter cover spectrum that we see. It does not give you the CMB which we see. And initially, I was sort of loath to accept this. 
Eventually, I had to be dry kicking and screaming and saying, yes, they are quite right. The original model was based on the following idea, that in the very early universe, the density is high, and therefore the um, pressure is low. Pressure gradients don't matter in the early universe. It's what's called a silent universe, very much like pure dark matter. In the late universe, where it behaves like a cosmological constant, when the density is low, also it behaves silently. And I assumed, or we assumed, that you could just smoothly patch this in between. Well, it turns out not. Okay? What happens is there is an acoustic effect. There's an acoustic, co-moving acoustic horizon that, when you look at it, uh, already reaches right, 10 mega, uh, 10 mega parasite scales at a redshift of about 10. What happens is there is no structure formed in this adiabatic model. If there's no structure formed, then all the stuff just nicely oscillates, or badly oscillates around, as the people doing the original analysis said, and it just doesn't work. Um, since I don't have much time, I'm not going to say very much about these various topics you can see here. You've heard about them, and you'll probably hear about them again in your time. The original, the generalized, the modified, the uh, variable, leaking gas, all of the various things. Um, all of which don't really address this question, and that's a battle which I've fought many years. And again, we just heard now about another model, mentioned chip leaking gas, but it's a Friedman pipe model. That is not the chip leaking gas or at least not from my perspective. Because intrinsically, it's an inhomogeneous model. And it must be. So now, to, to progress and say where this thing has gone over the years, um, I have to tell you a few words if you don't know about KSNs. One of the ingredients that was particularly interesting in the original Tupacan gas model is an idea of fuel fluid duality. In fact, there's more than that. There's actually fuel fluid duality. There is an equivalence or relationship between fluid dynamics and general relativity, all of which is built into the model. So what I've tried to summarize in this rather complicated slide is where this all fits into something called K-essence. And K-essence is just the most general Lagrangian model you can write down involving a single scalar field and its first derivative. So the Chaplinian gas itself sits down here. It's a rather special case from a more general class called tachyon models. Um, there are other models over here which share the feature that they only involve the velocity, if you like, of this scalar field. And in fact, they are very similar to sort of general type models which have been bandied about about four years, two years ago for um, the most general thing you can write down, which would actually describe dark matter and or dark energy in the late universe. Now, <clears throat> in terms of these K-essence type models, and I should mention, I, I once upon a time tried to push a term for this. I call this cosmology. K, cosmology with a K, so the C. Um, my friends and colleagues talked me out of it, which is perhaps a good thing. I did eventually get a student to use that term, not knowing, and I found out later, that it's actually a particular form of Satanism. <laughs> no relation, no relation. <laughs> right. So, for a general K-essence, a general K-essence behaves like a perfect fluid. You can write down the stress energy tensor, the Lagrangian is the pressure, the energy density is essentially the Hamiltonian density, you can write down a four velocity, normalized, then there's a speed of sound, you have conditions for this thing to be stable, you have conditions for this thing to be causal, or subluminal, okay. which tell you things about the derivatives of the Lagrangian with respect to the velocity, and you have field equations. Now, as I said a few moments ago, I, I've campaigned long and hard over the years dissuade people from the idea that they can simply proceed to write down anything and call it a uh, Chaplinian gas or a, something like a unified dark energy dark matter model, right, as long as they work within a Friedman context. And like the original Chaplinian gas model, if mentioned at all, it's nonsense because what it says is you have dark matter 
Later you have dark energy, but that's not the universe that we inhabit. We inhabit a universe in which there is dark matter and dark energy. We're seeing them at the same epoch, number one. So you have to deal with an inhomogeneous universe. And the thing is, that's hard. The second thing is that you have to go beyond perturbation theory. This was a longer and harder battle to fight. But it's important. And it also, I think, has something to say to some of the issues which were raised on Monday. So let me take a moment then to talk about, and unfortunately you don't get to see the nice animation because I was forced into PDF. So this brain nicely moves along. One of the things which is fascinating about this model is because of this field fluid mapping, you can actually look, map it onto the motion of a brain in a higher dimensional space. The same is true of the tachyon type models, of which it's a particular subset. And then, by looking at the embedding of this thing, you end up with something which is, in some sense, real generalization of the Trevelyan gas. Okay, it's a tachyon model. So instead of having the square root of A, which is the characteristic parameter of the Trevelyan gas, it's replaced by the potential for a scalar field. Now you go through the same sort of exercise and you calculate the co-moving acoustic horizon and it's going to depend on the power that appears from that potential. So for example, for n equals zero, you're back to the Trevelyan gas. <coughs> but for different values, you get different things. Now, the main point, whoops. What you can do then is the following. Um, people who do astrophysics, um, cosmology, generally work with something called this spherical model. And the spherical model just says this. If I take an overdense patch of dust in a Friedman universe, what it will do is it will expand out. At a certain point, it will stop. It will collapse back onto itself. And there's a well-established theory for calculating in cold dark matter the fraction of glass objects in this. Well, what we finally get to a number of papers, and this is the relativistic version, is to extend that idea, treating the case where there's pressure, number one, and lots of people are trying this, but most importantly, treating the following effect that there are pressure gradients. And many people have tried to approach this thing and say, well, if I have a spherical top type thing, then there are no pressure gradients. Ignoring the fact that, yes, there are, there are infinite ones at the edges. Right? So what we did is to picture the thing as follows. You start with the basic equation of conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and the rich degree equation, you take the divergence of the latter, and you write down inhomogeneous equations for the behavior of the expansion parameter h, and uh, also use the Einstein equations to get rid of um, r mu nu. And then finally to treat this pressure gradient terms, what we did is we used, oops, sorry, um, certain approximate treatment for the for these um, inhomogeneous, the pressure gradient terms. Right? So we picture it as a sort of um, Gaussian lump. That's not absolutely necessary. We've played with various versions of this. The key thing is they all have this characteristic form. Okay? And one of the things about that is when you define the size of this thing, that introduces a scale. Size doesn't matter. Second of all, you can sort of see from the structure of this thing that now it doesn't matter what the equation of state is in a Friedman model. What matters is the equation of state locally in this lump. So let me just take a moment to tell you what happens and compare the two cases. So in the red curve there, it's just starting from an initial small perturbation at radiation matter equality, seeing how it evolves. So it evolves as follows. The perturbation grows, the density contrast grows, as long as it's outside of its acoustic horizon. Okay? As soon as it enters the acoustic horizon, however, up here, then the stuff starts to oscillate, perturbations die away, and it behaves exactly like the uh, people who first said, how oh, can't possibly work? But, but, if you make the initial perturbation a little bit larger, then something quite different happens. What happens is 
Yes, the acoustic horizon grows and grows, but the density contrast turnaround is still high enough that it's still outside its acoustic horizon, and so it never enters into the acoustic horizon. And so what happens is the density, per density contrast just goes through the roof. In other words, you're forming collapsed objects out of an object of a system with pressure, right? but you need an initial density contrast, which is high enough. And that's the sense in which you need a non-perturbative theory. Let's talk about these things. Now, of course, then, since you need a minimum density contrast, you have to do a lot of work to map out, in a sense, phase lines. And the phase lines will depend on the potential. It'll be different for a leading gas versus a quadratic potential versus a quartic potential. So you see very different cases lying there. The most important thing to notice, of course, Observationally, we have information from the cosmic microwave background about the distribution of initial perturbations. And that's a black curve there, which is marked by sigma. And since it's a Gaussian, anything which lies up in this region is going to be exponentially suppressed, whereas anything which lies below that line will not be. And so what happens is, in this Tachyon model, you end up with something which looks like that. So you can actually calculate the spectrum, or you can calculate the fraction and condensed objects at a given scale. And so the original speaking gas is an absolute failure because that's down there. The quadratic potential, or the n equals 1, looks like that. The n equals 2 looks like that. And so those sort of collapsed objects we don't know what they look like. We haven't followed through the endpoint. But they very well be the sort of um, stand-in for the primordial black hole, for example. Um, because of time, I'm going to skip uh, through the next two slides. They really have to do not so much with the Schlegel gap, but the whole idea of this fluid field duality and the idea of building exact solutions and some fun things I had some students work on, but it's not privy to this. What I would like to do in my last couple of minutes is to say, well, since the original Chaplinian gas was dead at one year old, what, 15 years later, what, right? Um, there's been lots of work. It continues to hold lots of fascination for people. But in my opinion, this is my personal opinion, there is little of it that involves any taste, right? Nothing which captures the simplicity of the original model, which I have failed. So is there anything you can do which has that and maybe offers an opportunity to sort of revive the sort of feeling that maybe we're going to start to understand the universe again, which is what the workshop is about. So I will claim yes. Okay. And the idea is the gauge depleting gas. So this is very, very new stuff there. So the basic idea is the following. The original Spleven gas is what's called a um, purely kinetic chaosis model. It has a global symmetry. So if I shift this scalar field phi, which corresponds to the embedding of this brain in the higher dimensional space, okay, then nothing happens. But as a physicist, the first thing you do when you see a global symmetry like that is you say, let's gauge it and see what happens. So let's do it. It's a simple enough, it's a one-line exercise to write down then what the corresponding gauge field theory looks like. And in fact, uh, if you look at the embedding of this thing, then these gauge fields are actually holdovers, they're inheritors of the shift field. The part parts actually inherited from the shift field in the higher dimensional space in the embedding. So no matter how you look at it, this is the most general natural thing. In fact, what we were looking at before was a very, very special case. Now, these shift fields now become Goldstone bosons. The Goldstone bosons get eaten by the Gaze bosons. And as a field theorist, what one does is say, well, the easiest way to look at this is in terms of what's called the unitary gauge. And in the unitary gauge, this fine field that we started making so much noise about has completely disappeared. It's now been eaten by the gauge field to make the gauge field massive. Now you look at what that thing looks like, and you look at the equations of motion, 
and you start to say to yourself, ah, I see some things. Number one, I see that this looks like a relativistic type 2 superconductor model with a very funny nonlinear mass type term. <coughs> Number two, if I know anything about that and a little bit of first year electrodynamics and um, maybe some things about the stress energy tensor of electromagnetism, then I can look at that and I can say, well, there's going to be a charge dust like solutions with electric field lines that imply that there's going to be anisotropic pressure number one. So they're shear. That's something we didn't have in, for example, the Tachyon model. Number two, um, there are three eigenvalues for that pressure, two of which are positive and one of which is negative. And if anybody is surprised by negative pressure, because that's often bandied about how long it to negative pressure, everybody in first year physics, who anybody who's ever dealt with capacitor is steam map. Because the capacitor, by definition, their field between the plates of the capacitor pulls the plates together. It does not push it apart. It is negative pressure. There are other type solutions, magnetic type solutions, which I've only just started to look at. And so I'm not going to say anything about those. But I do want to close that on a positive note. Um, this unified dark matter, dark energy models that we started off, not by ourselves, there are, of course, many competitors, um, retain their intellectual appeal, again, because they offer a picture of a universe which we can make sense of. But they're tough. They require that you confront inhomogeneity, that you confront nonlinearity, and those are tough things, and people don't like to do tough things, particularly uh, observational astronomers, so they will stick to their Lambda CDM. Um, the quadratic tachyon model, I must say, is at least one model, one adiabatic model coming out of all this, which seems to work. The only thing which nobody has calculated is the cosmic microwave background effects, and their back reaction effects. Maybe this gauge leaving gap is also viable, but it's still in its infancy. So, if the next conference, provided there is a next conference, provided I'm alive, provided Trump hasn't blown up the world, perhaps I'll be able to say something about that. And lastly, I just want to thank the NRF for supporting this work through the years. And just to say, you can look at my webpage. Some of the things I've mentioned here, some of the things I haven't had a chance to mention here, are available on the webpage. So thank you. Sorry? How did you define the quadratic tachyon, the third point on your conclusion? What is well, the actual okay. that defined it? It's, it's viable in the sense that um, the quadratic tachyon model will produce about 50% in um, condensed objects. Okay? It is not, if you look at the um, total analysis, it is not more unnatural in terms of its parameter set than lambda CDM. What we don't know is whether that <coughs> condensation is enough to give you an acceptable cosmic microwave background. Um, members of the collaboration who were working on that went to Australia to be their pastors, never to be heard from again, and none of the members of the team had the wherewithal, because it is, again, hard. You have to really do this in a non-linear, an inhomogeneous way, the wherewithal to do it. And nobody else has picked up the baton. Sorry, my question was much simpler. I was just asking oh, what kind of action described that uh, quadratic tachyon. So you have a Kaisen's model or the Okay, the quadratic, it's just um, instead of instead of the instead of the square root of A, which you have in the chip leaving gas, it would be phi squared times another constant. That's the quadratic. So the quartic it would be phi to the fourth. <clears throat> about the gauge uh, strategies. So you have this uh, kind of electric and magnetic discipline, right? So you said that uh, you have to be brave and look at the uh, and you use, uh, you know, if you have constraints, you restrict on how much modulated it is in the universe. So does this, in principle, put constraint on the gauge strategy as. Uh, uh, maybe it does. Okay, that's something still to be looked at. Um, well, for example, take, take 
to put them some perspective on that, um, look at what people do with LGB type models. Right. Right. That's the same. It's the same, right? You can say, on average, that the universe looks isotropic, does not say that it actually is homogeneous. In the LTB models, dust is used then to explain all the observations. What I'm saying is, this fits into that same general category. There are known solutions of charged LTB, dust. Okay? This is a little bit different because the equations are a little bit, this, this um, interaction type mass term makes it a little bit messy, so I don't know what happens. Yeah, I agree. Mean, right. you know, but some terms are suppressed, you know. Yeah. You know, it's gonna keep some of the um, we can uh, relate that. Uh, we have an, okay, thank you. Just more, maybe before this meeting. Um, where do you expect to do the A field find different way and over D mu is different. D mu for the A field is different from D mu phi. Um, here. Yeah, that is different from that uh, covariant derivative for. No, it's the same. It's just the general. But that case, it, that's not actually. That's a general. That's a general way you write it down, right? In fact, because the A is commute, right? Because it's an abelian theory. It would become partial mu a nu minus partial mu a nu. So it's linear. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, we have to switch to the next talk. Next time, very good.